Hello boys and girls. In today's video we are going to talk about the axiom of regularity aka the axiom of foundation. This is an axiom in standard uh, set theories such as zermelo frankel set theory. And you know, famously this is the axiom which has the effect of ruling out the possibility of sets which contain themselves. We are going to study this effect and we are studying the, how it happens and the motivation for it to be adopted um, and I'm not really going to talk about set theory uh, too much I'm uh, actually going to explain it in terms of a simpler theory namely theories of ar uh, arithmetic and in particular of course uh, piano arithmetic and um, the weaker Robinson arithmetic which is the arithmetic without induction and thereby also without the uh, equivalent a, you know, minimality principle. We are going to discuss this, uh, what I mean exactly. And uh, this, uh, you know, minimal element statement is the corresponding principle that in set theory is the axiom of regularity. That's how things connect. And um, so for context, um, I'm also di uh, discussing this as an explanation of a topic that came up in another physicist's um, YouTube channel. He was doing an interview, and um, there was a sh you know short, a uh, little bit confused in my opinion, um, back and forth bit, uh, about the axiom of regularity, um, and I'm going to explain why that that came up. Um, but uh, the YouTuber is called Kurt. He has his channel uh, Theories of Everything, and uh, a month ago or so he said, uh, "Hey, everybody, make some videos about physics and and uh, consciousness." This is what his channel is about. And so I thought, um, since I, you know, since I have a, a, a good grasp about of regularity, I'm going to do so, a sort of explainer. I was writing down um, the script for this video. I wanted to talk a lot more about transfinite induction in set theory, but uh, he also wanted the videos to be under one hour. So I will uh, restrict myself to uh, the spicy topic of uh, weak arithmetics. Um, if you are just here for the uh, the formal explanations, then you can now skip ahead for probably about five minutes or so. But I will uh, I want to give some some context and some explanation to in to what extent um, this is like philosophically also uh, interesting and not just the math. So there are timestamps below. You can jump ahead. Otherwise, I'm quickly going to talk about uh, Wittgenstein. So. This uh, is the Tractatus, um, the early Wittgenstein text. It's just a text with um, 110 pages or so. And it contains this, uh, these famous lines um, of what one cannot speak, uh, of that one must be silent. So <laughs> the, the young Wittgenstein um, working with and I think under Russell and uh, Good colleagues with Ramsey, um, he had uh, this perspective that only that which can be really properly formalized in a consistent fashion is is really um, like it's really possible to make sensible statements about it. And uh, the, the the sentence I just quoted is basically saying you know everything else is you know this is just really gibberish. And every, every philosophy before that talking about God and the world. Uh, they must have had it wrong because they didn't have the formal tools or they were not rigorous enough. Um, so naturally, this um, the time in which this is written is about the same time as um, these uh, formalizations of set theory comes up. And this is not an accident because a few years prior, um, the, the whole you know, logicism project was started. They had then their takes on science and the world in general, and in particular mathematics, you know, turning mathematics into logics, arguing and arguing for the, the idea that mathematics is really just logics. I mean, this gets a little bit fussy on where you want to draw the line and how you want to use the words. But um, the uh, the connection to regularity here is that um, if you um, and I'm going to be brief here um, to, to uh, have enough time to uh, discuss actually the, the, the set theory in, in, in some mathematical detail. But the connection there is that um, you can view a set theory, whatever set theory, whatever axioms you adopt as a, 
a higher order logic in the sense that um, there's a correspondence between classes and, and predicates and sets as a special case of classes are therefore also predicates. And if you have, you know, an, an um, element hood of sets, um, then you're expressing properties. So uh, the simplest example is, you know, you have the set of natural numbers and there's the property in the natural numbers of being a multiple of seven. So for example, 21 and um, 28 uh, would have the property of being multiples of seven, whereas 30 does not. And um, you have this property that I just expressed. And at the same time, you characterize some subset, in this case, an infinite subset of the natural numbers. And that is a set and your, your set theory has quantifiers um, over sets and so it has quantifiers over predicates in that sense and uh, in that way you have uh, the capability about talking about um, uh, you know existence of predicates and the um, one complicated thing in logic is always um, uh, you know reflexivity things talking about themselves and this is also the the, the scenario in which uh, in Kurt's interview that that came up uh, regularity is interesting insofar as it is that axiom which was adopted to rule out the, the possibility of having um, sets which contain themselves and in, in, in this in the sense that I just described this this means uh, talking about uh, properties which um, exhibit uh, the property that they are themselves right so you have a property and it, it, it might have some properties and it ha might have itself as property and and so on um so uh on the property side it might get confusing quickly and indeed when uh, people were developing developing this stuff 100 years ago it was uh, like pretty confusing now the funny thing is if you read tractatus now um and you're familiar with some introductory uh, textbook on predicate logic then you will have the feeling that uh, this guy is, is you know spending a lot of pages for things which are uh, re relatively simple because he has to explain, you know, he, he really explains what a tautology is and how predicate logic works. And he surprises the reader um, 100 years ago with, with some of these formal logic things. And then he has his spin on how it relates to ontology. But really, um, coming to it today is... Uh, like it's 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 funny to see how how things progress how things like become the the common knowledge the common language and and how then uh, it it appears that this is uh, like wasting a lot of time on things that you, you could just read a, a math book first and then say everything much quicker i actually got this book when um i uh, moved to germany you know i moved to germany um to the german aerospace center to, to do my phd and there was um, uh, Adrian, a uh, physics student who um, was also studying philosophy. And you know, I was interested in, in Wittgenstein back then. I discussed this with him a little bit. And then uh, he, uh, when, I, when, I, um, when I went away out of Vienna, um, he gave me this book as a farewell present with this cute in in inscription. He says, uh, maybe uh, you can make something out of it. I couldn't. Good luck with your rockets. <laughs> Um, so he uh, had to read, read that for his courses, um, but obviously he found it weird and uh, had no, not much fun with it. But I then read it. I actually read it in front of the um, house that Wittgenstein built. He, you know, he was he was in Vienna, um, and it was quite influential. Not because I agreed with with the text, but um, just to see how things developed. Right, this was before I got really into uh, formal logic, and. Um, you know, all the math I study, I study for doing physics. I'm, I'm a physicist, but um, if you would look at my, my YouTube channel, you would think I'm just interested in logic, but it, it is for the purpose of doing uh, proper physics. And uh, this uh, was before I really understood all these things. And it definitely influenced me in a way that when I finally came across uh, people discussing physics, computation, and all these things, I, I I was already hooked, right? I was already saying, oh, there, there are some interesting things that I want to understand better. Okay, so um, uh, with that said, you know, I, I discussed this quickly because my motivation is here to, to show that if you talk about um, 
uh, sets including themselves, there's always also the mirror image where you can say this is about predicates speaking about themselves and and uh, and you don't have to force this sort of reading on it, but it's worth uh, keeping in mind and reflecting on it. And the same goes, um, the same, you know, the same uh, Wittgenstein sort of relationship between, or, you know, idea of relationship between formal languages and, and what we have in our head or what we can think and express was, is, of course, always brought up still today. And people make arguments in one or the other direction. I will not make a judgment on that in this video. but. When we talk about um, first order logic, which is sort of the, the nice logic with completeness theorem and so on, then uh, there's always the capability of t reflecting on it. What does it actually mean for epistemological reasons, ep epistemology, ep epistemological consequences that mathematical theorems that we're discussing have on us, or if they have or do not have that. And um, in particular, when we talk about a theory being able to capture um, some models categorically or not, as we will see in this video, um, what that really means. Uh, okay, so with that said, um, let's uh, jump into the video uh, proper. So I have here for you um, that might be interesting to read if you want to know some history. And I have a screen capped um, an excerpt. So there is this guy's golem. I have the page here open. Is this very um, happy looking fella. Um, he uh, was reflecting on Zemelos theory. So Zemelos theory, I have the Wikipedia page here, is um, the set theory of 1908 dated here, which is before Zemelo Frankel set theory, right? Not to be confused with the Zemelo Frankel of Zemelo, or Zemelo Frankel choice set theory. That is the standard set theory in academics, if you, you can say that like that today. This was sort of the precursor. And uh, Temelo wrote down a bunch of axioms. These are now here on the screen. And notably, um, they don't contain the axiom of regularity, right? So he did not um, have, have that here yet. Um, and it also does not contain the axiom of replacement, uh, which is very interesting, but we will not discuss in this video. So um, he published uh, these axioms and then people like uh, Zemelo came along and uh, pointed out um, some, some features of that, that theory. In particular, the degree to which it does not really um, pin down uh, a particular idea of sets. So if you want, you can press pause and, and read this uh, little piece from his from Skolem's uh, 1922 uh, article, um, uh, where he uh, like highlights how, um, sadly my my screen is there. <laughs> Let me actually make this smaller. He highlights, hmm, doesn't really work. He highlights how, um, okay, sorry, I cannot put this on the screen that you can read it all. Um, he highlights how uh, the, there is the possibility in Semelo's theory for this infinite descending chains for sets which contain themselves and that the, the set um, uh, enables the interpretation for two domains B and, and uh, P prime one with and one without uh, these this sort of um, self-containing sets. And um, so he reflects on that and it is then a few years later, when von Neumann, who came up with his ordinal um, theory, um, ordinals modeled in, in set theory, where he wants to use um, the well-foundedness property and induction, and then really advocates for, for adopting uh, the axiom that rules out this um, self-containing object. So this is sort of the history where we have it. Um, it is also equivalent then to induction principles, which can be proven from it. And um, this will be the topic of another uh, video for, of mine. I think um, I will make another one hour video on the topic of transfinite induction, but to keep it short in this video, I will just talk about arithmetic. Okay, so this is for a little bit context. Um, so uh, let's actually like spell out what does the axiom of regularity say. So it says for all sets S, if the sets are not the empty set, i.e. if the sets are not empty, then there exists an element such that 
in S such that the intersection of S and X is the empty set. So again, if you have a set which um, is not empty, i.e. classically which contains some element, then there is also an element in S which is entirely different from S in the sense that they don't share any elements, right? This is what the axiom says. Um, we are going to uh, discuss in the video the least number principle in arithmetic. So, you know, th this is the form. Um, it, it, people always say this is a little bit obscure um, compared to other axioms, maybe of similar set theory. Um, the nice thing is we are going to discuss the least number principle, which has basically the same form, but which because the uh, natural numbers are only countable infinite and which, because they're li linearly ordered has the sort of more straightforward um, um, interpretation. And it talks about uh, minimality and then you can take some of the intuition back to set theory. And uh, people also like to usually express uh, regularity as sort of the existence of a mil minimal element. And we're going to discuss what that means. So, okay, so I want to talk about the least number principle and for that um, I would have to say some words about um, the, the von Neumann model because we wanted to discuss the minimal number principle also in its incarnation of set theory where it looks most close to uh, the regularity axiom. So. Um, I mean, I have again here Wikipedia uh, page open. I basically just show you this to to give you a reference and to show I'm not making things up. But the uh, von Neumann model, uh, you know, you can if you don't know it, then you can look at the page. If you know it, skip two minutes ahead. But it is the one way to encode the um, natural numbers in set theory. Um, what you want to do is you want to find some set which contains objects. Um, such that for the totality of it, you can prove all the um, axioms of uh, piano arithmetic in this case, but it really goes for any theory that you model in your set theory. You find objects and then you show that uh, with the axioms of set theory, um, the all the axioms of the theory which you want to represent, which you want to model are fully fulfilled. And um, what, what you do here is the axiom of set theory tell you there's some empty set and then you can do uh, use pair, uh, pair construction of sets to construct other elements. And in this way, uh, what you do is um, you postulate, okay, the empty set is going to represent the number zero. And then every subsequent number is represented by the set which contains all numbers so far. So for example, the number one is the set which cont contains just zero. The number two is the set which contains uh, zero and one, the number three is the set which contains one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So the number uh, 2000 will contain um, 2000 sets, right? It will contain zero, one, and so on, 299, um, 1999. Um, and then if you want, you can, of course, then you know, write it down what this means in terms of the empty set and you find all these sets are sets next to each other and um, nested and eventually you get down to the empty set. Um, the um, theory of piano arithmetic, as we will later see, I will show you the axioms explicitly, but um, it has uh, as a primitive in the general uh, standards presentation in its theory signature, the successor operation, right, which takes you from one number to the next to the successor number. and. Uh, conveniently, for this particular model, you know, it's not the only model of, of the natural numbers in set theory, but for this model, um, you can represent the su successor operation. Uh, as it is shown here, you say, you take uh, any set, in this case, we will apply it to the natural numbers, and you build a union with the singleton set, which contains n, and then um, this actually takes you from one uh, set to the next. And if you want, you can you know test it yourself. You can take the two and apply this operation to the two. Then you get necessarily something which also has, has a zero and, and uh, one in it, uh, but also the singleton, which contains this thing. And indeed, this is exactly then, um, this is exactly then this set. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, okay. So, Okay, I have written this down here, the S have constructed. Um, 
In uh, set theory with the axiom of infinity, you also have an infinite set, which is the set which contains all of these numbers. Um, and uh, also one nice thing about this model is that the if x and y are just natural numbers in this sense, then the uh, order relation, the strict order relation, is smaller than, uh, is represented exactly by the membership. So you see, for example, that uh, the set 2 is inside of the set 4, basically by construction. And indeed, uh, 2 is also smaller than 4. So small, this, the natural smaller than relation that you have in mind is exactly represented also by membership. So this is how the order is implemented. And indeed, you know, this does not actually just work for the natural numbers. It also works for ordinals which come after it in the von Neumann construction. But we are not going to need it in this video. We are going to need it in the next video. Um, okay, and so as you see down here, there's also this equality relation where, uh, you know, oh, firstly, I have here, um, sorry, there's of course a, a three missing there in the four. Let me actually fix that. Um, okay. So um, what I have here also is a statement that every natural number in, uh, in this model has a property that it is actually the set of all natural numbers smaller than it. Again, you know, by construction, this is how I started the definition of them. And this is uh, a relation that's going to be relevant to formulate the uh, least number principle in the set theoretical case. Okay, um, here one note, right? If, uh, without more context, let's uh, say for a moment that there exists a set C, for example, which contains itself. You know, this is what's ruled out then by regularity or by induction. But um, for the moment, let's um, let, let's allow this. You know, don't adopt uh, similar Frankel uh, set theory, but actually allow this object. Then a few things are true. Like, like by definition, um, C is a member of itself. Right, and then so um, you know this order relation. I defined it for the natural numbers or for ordinals. But if we also use this notation for C, then we see that, for example, C is smaller than itself. Right? This just says that C. You know, by, by definition, this just says that C is a member of itself. Right? So formally, C is smaller than C. This this set is then you can make this construction, and also uh, the successor of of C is uh, C itself, right? Because if you just apply the definition of the successor and the singleton is just a C and the union of a set with itself is just the set itself. So you have this sort of, this phenomenon, right? Um, I emphasize it where, because something alike will also appear with some models in the, um, with the Robinson arithmetic. Okay, um, so, um, I want to talk the uh, talk about the least number principle in arithmetic. This is something which is basically equivalent to the induction axiom, right? Uh, induction is a strong axiom sh uh, schema in uh, piano arithmetic, and um, I will show you the formalities in a second. But uh, what it says is the following: It says that if in the natural numbers um, and any property that you choose, if there's some number which has that property then there is also some smallest number which has the property, right? So, um, for example, um, you can talk about the numbers which are bigger than 50 and divisible by seven, right? And I can immediately tell you a number, like um, the number 7,000 is for sure divisible by seven, it's bigger than 50. And the least number principle states that, okay, there exists, I, I just gave you an example, there exists a number which has the property, then the least number principle says that there's also a smallest number, small with respect to the ordering in the natural numbers which has the property. And you know, I could think about it now, I guess it will be, is it 56, I guess, is 56 divisible by seven, I think so. I think this is like good Grotendieck uh, prime territory. Um, I don't want to think about this, <laughs> this effect. Uh, too much now, but you see, um, 
this then says uh, the like the the axiom the schema says that such a thing must exist. Um, the classical variant in any case, and indeed in this case I can immediately uh, even you know, tell you what it is just by thinking about it. Okay, so I, I had an example here for another property which is um, you know yes, famous. The the taxi cab numbers are these these uh, numbers which can be written as the sum of two cubes. There's this nice uh, Ramanujan story, and this is also you know one of these properties like being able to write it in various uh, uh, ways of sums of cubes there's some big numbers which have the, the property but uh, the uh, least number principle will tell us there must be some smallest number right and if you allow for the number two then, then the smallest example will be the number two and uh, of course the famous number is this 1789 you know if you if you rule out i don't know this Sort of sort of trivial case, and let's say this is the smallest example. This is just my motivating example here. Okay, so this is the, the property. We are going to see the formal expression in um, in piano arithmetic in a second. But uh, what? How do you write it actually down in terms of the model that we just discussed, right? So I call the generic property. Um, okay, I will just show you the whole page, right? I don't make any secrets. So sorry. Um, I call this generic property T. This is, we're going to have this as a schema. It works for every property. And um, I just said the, the Neumann no, uh, naturals have this property. Um, I can define a class for every uh, uh, property. You can define the uh, corresponding class. And if you have full separation, the separation axiom, then this is also a set. So I can just as well call it set theory, assuming you know the, the strong set theory. And um, here, my, my dot 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 means always the sort of definition or equivalence. So to say that the, the number n is in this class, in this subclass of the natural numbers or subset of the natural numbers, class notation really just means that in being able to express t of n with the element hood symbol, right? You, if if um, theta is just uh, some class, then this is this thing here on the left side is really just notation for uh, the right hand side. Okay, and then um, the the statement which I just made about uh, minimal elements is written down exactly like so. So you know if I, I I will spell it out again and you can follow here in this set theoretical formulation. If um, some a number has the property which classically is the same as saying um, that the class is not uh, empty then there exists a number and this number is going to be the smallest natural number with the property um, and in the model in the, in the Neumann model um, to say that there is um, you know to say there is a smallest number with the property is to say that no number below that number have the property and if I build the intersection of n in the model with uh, this subset of natural numbers and the intersection is the empty set then this exactly means that there is no number below n which has the property t or theta right so to say to say that the intersection of of n meaning all numbers below and theta is empty just exactly means that no number below n has the property t if you think about it for a second right so uh, here is also the, the right below the statement um, for this instance t in, uh, in, in uh, the piano arithmetic language, um, where um, you know I'm going to define more formally define uh, the smaller than in uh, symbol in piano arithmetic or Robinson arithmetic in a second. But this is these are two, the same two statements, right? It says if there exists any m with the property, then there also exists a minimal n which has the property but all the numbers below n do not have the property right? these are the same statements just with different notation uh, i mean also in different theories here you said theory here i have the most straightforward predicate discussion right and again coming back to my uh, philosophical discussion uh, before um, here you have this correspondence explicitly right you have properties and you know you don't if you're here in um, 
talking philosophy, you don't need to talk about natural numbers just. You can also say, you know, uh, I don't know, Nikolai is, uh, was born in Vienna. Uh, and then you can talk about the property of being born in Vienna and you can talk about all uh, entities, terms, which are born in Vienna, you know, or other Viennese people talk about the class and so um, all the axioms that you might adopt for particular classes namely the sets um, let you express then statements about properties like you know being born in Vienna and so on and so forth so here is the the, the translation between the predicates um, as Wittgenstein ha would have it but he was also uh, I mean it has been <laughs> has been a decade since I read that book but I'm, I'm certain he talks about uh, sets as well mengen in german okay and um yeah clearly you know if you look at that statement this is exactly um this statement right so here this is uh, in you know this uh, like the statement in the brackets anyway the um the set theoretical regularity axiom if you adopt it as an axiom then you adopt it for all sets meaning for all classes which are sets if you want and then it says it for all sets holds this statement this statement here is the, exactly the, the has the, exactly the same shape as the one i motivated here for a particular set right but also by uh, induction or by the equivalent minim minimality uh, principle that we are um, going to see the consequences of this works for all uh, predicates in fact so this is this is a weak and strong at the same time. It's strong in the sense that actually we are going to postulate it for all predicates, not just the ones which are made into set by some set theory. But of course, it is a weaker statement in the sense that here I'm just talking about it in, in terms of the natural numbers. And the natural numbers are a much sort of smaller domain to talk about, um, at least the standard model, than set theory. Okay. So not to confuse you here, but I want to highlight that this is quote unquote the same principle. It's bo it's both a minimality statement, um, but the set theoretical one is more complicated to interpret because sets are not um, a priori linearly ordered objects, right? As the natural numbers are. Here we have the successor operation that um, reaches all numbers in the initial segment and this is not um, available for sets in general and that's why the regularity axiom is a little bit more obscure but people like to express it also as minimality statement because then um, firstly they, they you just uh, you know need, need to invoke minim minimality and then um, you have a better idea of what sort of object the existence of is postulated with the axiom um, and um, okay, so um, I will also just show you the, the Wikipedia page that I have um, that I've, uh, cited here. So this is um, uh, induction bounding and least number principles. I think this is probably written by somebody who is into reverse mathematics because it's a super formal statement uh, like page compared to some other introductory arithmetic pages. Uh, and you have here a bunch of uh, statements, which if you're in the context of um, piano arithmetic should be uh, equivalent to each other. Although in the context where they're discussed here with re reverse mathematics, with second order arithmetics, which are sort of weaker, they are not really the same because you also adopt them only for certain predicates and so on. Okay, these are details on the side. Don't want to confuse it too much, but this is the one we're discussing here. This is the one which I have just written down for a particular T the schema and here you have the induction principles um, if um, if you don't um, you know if, if, if you uh, if you don't know everything of the, uh, these things by heart you might want to look it up now because we're going to make use of those but I will also restate them again okay so I've written down some of the principles that I'm going to make use of to prove the things that we want to prove um, the first is just uh, the definition of what I really mean with uh, this bounded quantification, right? If I say for all z smaller than y and something, something, then what I really mean is this, for all z if they are smaller than something, something. And below uh, you see some equivalences and implications that I'm going to make use of. You know, if you talk about arithmetic, it's very easy just to stay constructive and that's what I'm going to do. I will be explicit if I use excluded middle. 
Um, here we have uh, constructive free valid impl um, implications and equivalences. So the first one says that if uh, for all x um, something does not hold, then this is equivalent to saying that there does not exist any element which validates it. Um, then um, here uh, a statement for a conjunction to represent it in terms of impl implication and then uh, the um, uh, contraposition of course. Okay. So um, let's get a little bit more juicy. So now we are going to introduce the theory of Robinson arithmetic. And in a word, this is really just um, piano arithmetic without induction. And instead of induction, um, one stronger quotes and quotes axiom is added, namely that every number had, has a predecessor. Um, so uh, if you are interested, you can jump to the Wikipedia page, for example, on Robinson arithmetic. Uh, this is not such a bad page because it has the axioms here neatly summarized, uh, which I also have on my uh, on my page um, and um, then it also discusses variations of the axioms and uh, models and models is what we are interested in. There's also the Enlab page um, which um, does the same thing and then in the end at the bottom of the page discusses a model in particular that we are interested in. Um, we're going to discuss it in a second. You don't have to press pause. So. The uh, theory, like piano arithmetic, has a signature which in particular, in particular contains the successor operation, this is a primitive in this first order theory, a constant symbol, uh, zero, and then these arithmetic operations that uh, the axioms also talks about and um, clarifies the relation of these um, function symbols to each other. And then here are the axioms. If I have your letters X and Y, then whatever letter is in the axiom, you imagine a universal quantification before that, right? For all X holds, so and so. This is just for convenience in this case. You know, if you don't talk about universal algebra, that is really just a convenience. Um, so I, I will just, you know, for the sake of it, go through the six axioms here. Um, the first says that it's not the case that the successor of any number is zero, right? Okay, sounds reasonable enough. The axiom, second axiom says that um, if the successor of some number is the same as the success of another, then this already means that the numbers were the same. Then, okay, any number plus zero is this number itself. Then, um, you know, one of the, one of the, um, characterizations of the successor, right? The successor is just adding plus one. And if addition has the usual, you know, commutativity properties and so on, then it doesn't really matter where you add one. You can read it like that. You can also read it as a way of computing um, uh, addition and so on. Um, sorry. Okay, and then uh, X multiplied by zero is zero. And then a relation between addition, successor, and multiplication. Okay. And piano axioms would have now also the induction axiom, which we're going to see in a second as well. Um, but this theory does not have induction, but instead it has one formula, which is also implied by induction, actually. But here we don't have induction. We cannot prove it. So we adopt it as an axiom to get another arithmetic, which is sort of like a piano arithmetic. And so it says that four numbers y holds either the number is uh, the first number zero or there exists a number such that the success of that number is y right so this says every number is either the, the number zero or it has a predecessor in the, you know if you call the number predecessor in the usual sense this is um, the statement of predecessor existence is an existence statement you have an existential quantifier and you will notice that all the axioms so far uh, are actually super simple. They are only only have universal quantifiers and the symbols and the signature of the theory. This is actually, I mean, it's so like compared to other math, it's still a trivial statement. Every number is either zero or, the ha or has a predecessor. But like from a syntactic perspective, this number, this axiom is actually more complicated than those, right? <laughs> because it has an existential quantifier and it makes things more complicated. And un this axiom is not provable from those statements, for example. Okay, so. Um, 
this is the usual way of uh, setting up also piano arithmetic with the standard signature and then we can define for example the order relation like so uh, you should think about uh, that it makes sense because it will play a role so um you uh, say that a number uh, k is smaller than a number n if there exists a number such that k plus the successor of the number is n, right? So, I mean, how to how to read that? So, firstly, the successor being here with the m is a sort of a trick to excluding adding zero, right? Yeah. Like yeah, now I'm speaking a little bit more semantically, but this says there exists some number and um, such that k plus and then the successor of a number um, this together is n um, again semantically speaking um, the smallest number zero would be allowed here but then this says k plus success of zero is n so k plus one is is uh, is n right if there's any number m bigger than zero, let's say five, then they would, they would say k plus six is, is n, right? So this characterizes that whatever m is, n is actually, like in terms of the standard model, a bigger number, right? I mean, you should think about this for a second and, and, and validate in your head that it should make sense that this is a good definition of the smaller than relationship, okay? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I I will do some some uh, some calculations there because I will later show when we adopt induction what that for example means for what the language can prove, right? I will not like stay too much about that because I I don't know if I get the rest of the uh, video through in fifty minutes, but I will try. Um, so here are some calculations, right? I now denote the natural numbers as, as this collection, right? We are, we are not in set theory. I don't want to talk about the set of natural numbers as an object in my theory. I will want to talk about the domain. Um, and for any number that uh, you can you can give me, uh, here the standard natural numbers, um, it turns out that this peculiar relationship holds, right? So um, if, um, you know, let's say division without rest um, if you multiply the zero with zero plus one and then divide by two you get a zero and you know, this is just zero if you do the same thing but instead of zero here you use one then you get one times two divided by two without rest is is one and this happens to be zero plus one and then if you go on and, and plug in something different then you get two times three is six divided by two, it happens to be three, and this is this. So you get this peculiar um, pattern, right? And so for any number in, in Robinson arithmetic, if you give me any number, for example, 9,000, and I have the time, I can write down this and validate this, and will, uh, like, meta, meta uh, mathematically, you know, I make the claim that will actually work, will actually turn out to work. Um, and then more we can speak about some implications, right? For example, so, of course, you know, you would have to define recursive function, blah, 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 in, in these languages, and it's possible to define this, this finite sum. Um, and so let's make the following observation. Given any particular n and the sum over uh, the numbers k, this is basically the right-hand side here, um, assuming that this turns out to be um, this expression, this multiplication, which corresponds to this, then what actually does happen um, if I don't go to n but n plus one? Well, uh, you know, I, I write this down here. This is just to n, but then one step further. This is this thing, and then I can use the uh, you know the normal arithmetic, which is also implied by by the axioms here and you know, some rewriting. Um, it turns then out that oops, it turns then out that this is actually of this shape, and this is again then of the shape. So this is an, some observation that I can make. I can, you know, for any particular number, I can, can do this thing. Okay. So now, you know, I know that for the first few numbers this worked and I know this, I mean, you recognize it. This is sort of the induction step. But since, since my theory does not have an induction axiom, it's not the case that now I can now conclude that this relation always holds, right? This is exactly what the axiom of induction uh, in, enables me to do it enables me to make a statement with a universal quantifier up front 
uh, I can maybe uh, evaluate this this stuff for every number, but I cannot make a claim inside of the language that this holds for all numbers, right? This is the power sort of, of the induction axiom. Okay, so we're going to get to induction later, um, but here now some of the some cool parts which might now explain some of uh, the, the explain the ways in which the regularity axiom or here in this case the least number principle which is the corresponding principle rules out uh, um, in the set theory case self-membership and in the uh, you know predicate speak uh, speak uh, case um, predicates uh, having themselves as property right this is sort of the, what was ruled out when Neumann like, threw it out so can he can do his ordinal stuff he wants induction and have a simple set theory but this is basically what is ruled out by adopting this this sort of regularity or minimality claims so um we're going to discuss a non-standard model of q I, I will mention a few uh and this will be fun and then at the end i will also mention non-standard models of piano arithmetic which might be maybe more surprising Okay, so um, models of Q. Well, the first model that is clear is the standard model of natural numbers. And I call it here sort of matchbox num uh, model. This is like when you say, when numbers, well, let's instead of matchbox, let's say bags of stones, right? You have a, a bag of stones with, with four, uh, a bag with four stones in it and a bag with seven stones in it. And then you can, uh, for each define an operation of addition by making a new bag and putting the, the the stones from both of the bags in it and then you get a uh what did they say four and seven and you get a bag with 11 um uh, stones in it and and there thereby like moved from uh, two numbers to a third number you added them and um more uh, to the point, the standard model uh, can be then represented, for example, with the Neumann model in a set theory, as we did, or you think about uh, recursive rewriting with uh, you know, strokes of uh, on, on paper um, that captures sort of this standard model, right? But uh, what we can do now in, in uh, Robinson arithmetic, as opposed to... Um, to piano arithmetic, the situation will change change in a certain way, as we will discuss later. Is what you can do is now, uh, since you don't have the induction axiom, is actually co compatible to add one more element. We call it infinite element if you want. I call it also C, similar to what I did already before when I discussed sets. And this, uh, you add this and you impose some uh, arithmetic rules, right? So. Okay, the first things um, are just commutativity of the numbers as we already had them. And then you say that C plus zero, uh, C times zero is zero. I mean, this is demanded by by the axioms here as well, right? This note, these uh, are the axioms for the arithmetic. They must hold for all numbers. And by all numbers, we don't just mean, we don't mean a particular model, right? We don't mean the standard natural numbers. The, theory, the syntactic theory does not know about the standard uh, natural numbers. The theory is a syntactic construct that you can interpret and you can read something into it, but the theory itself does not know, you know, how many numbers it has or, or if it has numbers which are sort of special as we have in this model now. So you have this number to be a model of the theory. We need that the C multiplied by zero is zero. And so we impose this. And we also say that c plus x is c again right for any x right so c plus 9001 is c again or c plus c is c again right in this sense we can call it infinite number because it behaves like like an infinite number as you might um, expect from an infinite number if you do um and here my latte is broken okay um Yeah, so um, some consequences. Um, as I said, C plus, for example, 1 is C. So this also means that there exists a Y such that C plus S of Y is C, right? I mean, Y equals 0. And, you know, any like any Y, like uh, uh, Y being 7 also would work. Like C plus the success of 7, I C plus 8 would also be C. Um, 
So by definition of our smaller than relationship in the arithmetic theory, right? By definition here, this means that C is actually smaller than C, right? This is just a formal statement of this, right? It's, of course, you know, when we write down the smaller symbol, we don't have that in mind, but the theory does not rule out that this, this is possible. I mean, it, it would rule it out as we will see with induction, but this weaker theory does not rule it out. So this theory actually does not rule out this model. And um, so by the way, this is also here shortly mentioned, explained in, in, uh, on this page. So you see how uh, removing axioms allows you to have different more models than you had before. I mean, in a way it makes sense, right? If you add constraints, then it might cut away models in the other direction. If you remove constraints, you get more models. Yeah, and uh, as mentioned in Wikipedia, this is not the only funky model. Uh, they mentioned that uh, polynomials with non-negative integer coefficients uh, form a model. So if you take polynomials with non-negative inter, um, integer coefficients, and but also the zero, and this is basically the polynomial ring or a subset of the polynomial ring with uh, uh, integer coefficients, then all these these axioms of the theory, these axioms here, they are not broken, right? You can take a polynomial and and add plus one, and you get another polynomial, and um, and all these rules, right? If you multiply a polynomial times the zero polynomial, you get a polynomial. These things are, are uh, this interpretation of the theory is possible. You can say, oh, this this um, um, this theory actually talks about this polynomial ring-like object. Okay, and um, to bridge this maybe back to um, to Wittgenstein, right? So th there arises the question that if we say that our um, our mind is sort of if you zoom out mechanistic in a, in a, in a, in a way that eventually um, you only have one way of expressing things then the existence of uh, competing models which might be very different uh, might uh, can be interpreted and or can be argued for and might be argued for by some people to, to imply that there are things we, we cannot capture as well right so just having a, a, the, the formal mind um, might suggest at least um, that there is something that we cannot pin down because it is then also the case that in piano arithmetic that there are non-standard models and indeed um, you cannot fix the theory um, in like you know um, in uh, this is the more complicated mathematical proofs Right. This is the, 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 the formal logic and meta logic which happened uh, a few years later. But in the end, uh, it goes as far and says, if you want to stick to the first order logic, then there is a lot of things which you cannot fix, right? Famously. Okay. Um, so, okay. Then, uh, then let's finally, uh, didn't write, write, uh, did it in under an hour, but uh, it might be worth to uh, still like complete this here. So, Piano arithmetic adds an axiom that for or an axiom schema that says for every predicate um, Q you get this induction, right? And so now, for example, going back to the induction example, we have validated for a bunch of numbers and we also have validated this implication, right? If it holds, so again, if it holds for this thing, then we have demonstrated with doing some arithmetic that it holds for the successor. And then this axiom exactly says, okay, well, that happened, that worked. So it is actually true that it happens, it works for all numbers, right? And now the funny thing is, however, that piano arithmetic also has non-standard models. So while we naturally think of the, the natural numbers as this, in terms of this standard mo model, you know, uh, matchbox and bags of stones sort of objects, right? They, they are just these. It turns out that they are also, it's, it's permissible in piano arithmetic to add infinite numbers, which um, sort of come beyond the, in, in, uh, the initial segments. And we are going to see some pictures later. Um, yeah, okay. So um, you can prove then, for example, that this 
axiom that I manually added to Robinson arithmetic that was manually part of Robinson arithmetic, namely the statement that every number is either zero or has a prede predecessor, actually follows from uh, the induction axiom. For the sake of simplicity, I will not prove that, but I will prove some other thing which are, is also interesting with induction. And um, uh, necessary then to understand the non standard model, um, I want to point out that it also proves that every number is either even or odd, right? You can, I mean, you can think about how will, will the proof go, right? You validate it for, for zero, and then you make the induction step. It cannot be that hard to prove that every number is even or odd. Like every, every this is, this area is of course this universal quantifier, and that is the, this is then the formal statement which the, the induction axiom gives you. Okay, um, so uh, to understand the relationship between minimal element and induction, in piano arithmetic as well, this proof is exactly the same than for set theory in transfer finite induction and regularity. Um, we mm, sorry. You know, when I talk for an hour, then my my nose is like tickling. Um, so uh, there's another form of induction called the complete induction, which on the nose uh, has a like a harder requirement. You now it looks exactly like induction before, but uh, similar, except the zero is not explicit and the successor op um, operation does not appear. But instead the in our definitions, the derived relationship of uh, smaller than appears here. So again, this zero and 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 the success operation, th these were the primitives in the way that I pulled up uh, the arithmetic theory, and I defined the smaller than relationship in terms of them. And then there is now an induction statement, um, which uh, we can prove from the the original standard induction statement, which does not use this symbols but instead uses that symbol right the relationship symbol and this is also then since set theory is not in uh, like in uh, defined in terms of some constants and some some operations but in terms of a relationship namely the membership relationship this is also then the uh, axiom that is then relevant for uh, set theory the transfinite induction or set induction actually which proves transfinite induction and in fact the set theory analog is basically exactly the same statement except the relation is not smaller than but membership okay um i will not prove it but this is equivalent to this induction even if that uh looks you know easier to um i mean depending on how you see it uh easier to work with you know here you just do a one step here you might have to prove um i mean you, you might you can assume more I mean, there's pros and cons, and uh, you can go to Wikipedia and you'll see different scenarios um, where this and that um, form of induction is easier to use. Um, but uh, these are actually derived from each other in some small steps, and without um, you know, going through everything, here's a small hint. You know, if you look at the bot bottom formula, then you see that if if this formula, which has a successor in it, um, in the universal quantifier, you can actually see then that if this holds, then obviously Q is true for uh, all numbers smaller than N, but also for N itself, right? So the universal quantifier becomes a universal quantifier without the S, but with an extra conjunction. You can quickly think about why that makes sense. And then uh, you can use this and and prove this form of induction from this form of induction. Okay, you can do that as a homework exercise. So I'm just highlighting that they are uh, the same, quotes and quotes, derivable from each other. And this is the form which is relevant for set theory and also for the minimal statement that we are going to uh, discuss in the final section here. So, sorry. Um, okay, this is uh, again the induction uh, statement, I'm going to take the uh, contrapositive, right? I've written down the formulas that I'm going to use. This is this here. And now what happens here in the proof of the equivalence, the classical equivalence at least, is I'm going to look at uh, particular cues which are of negated form. If I'm in a classical context, then negating twice brings me back. And so nothing is lost there. Um, in any case, 
uh, here I'm looking at particular predicates, namely the form of a negated form, right? So what I mean is classically, you know, I can, I can say um, I'm uh, born in Vienna and it's the same classically as saying I'm not not born in Vienna. And so there's nothing lost in considering only predicates which are of negated form, classically speaking. And uh, so I, in any case, again, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to hurry to not uh, go over time too much, but um, here uh, we're going to consider this negated predicates and then the same statement just reads like so. We can use then the, again the, the relation between implication and conjunction. This you know, I'll show it quickly to you. The rules that I'm, I'm applying, which are constructively valid here, yeah, these are these rules, right? Um, to rewrite the thing uh, as such. And, and then finally, what we get is this sort of statement. And this is exactly the, the, um, the least number principle bar the double negations. Um, here in, um, in the assumption, it's actually good that here, that the constructively speaking, it's good that here there are double negations because um, to assume existence is a strong assumption, right? So this um, this thing is a weaker assumption than just as, uh, than actually assuming ex existence. So if then an M exists which has T, then this certainly is true. Um, but the the implication also holds if there just does not not exist an an M. And um, the implication is uh, also double negated. Um, Again, if classically you can remove the double negations uh, constructively, um, sorry, if um, T is decidable, then, um, and you know that a, a number exists, then you can also look at for all numbers beneath M and you can check if there is a minimal element. Um, also, you can might adopt Markov's principle, um, which says that um, double negation elimination holds for desirable statements. It's just a comment for the type theorists among you also. Okay, um, so we have established this from um, the complete induction, which is um, the minimal, uh, the least uh, number principle, a minimal number principle. And now I'm going to look at the implications for uh, this sort of relation, right? What we are going to see in a second is that this, um, this statement here, which stems from induction, so which holds in piano arithmetic, or Heiting arithmetic, actually rules out that there are numbers with this property. And this goes as follows. So um, let's say you have any relation and define PR, there's another uh, property as such. Uh, there, if uh, the statement says there exists an X, exists x which actually is a um, and that for all y if r is in relation uh, if y is in relation to a then y is not a and this is basically a mirroring I'm, I'm just abstracting from from the expression here then this thing um, has the following implication if if a is in relation with, it, with itself then it means that this thing does not hold um, I mean, you can play this through. Let's say A um, is in relation with itself and there exists um, some number which has this property. Well, this number is then A. Um, and if for all Y uh, this expression holds, then it also holds for Y equals A. And then you have uh, uh, A is not A, right? So contradiction. Um, so that means um, if that thing holds, then if R is in relation to itself, this is contradictory, right? And so um, if the least number principle holds, uh, which, which holds by uh, assumption of induction, um, then the existence of an A, or we called it C, a C which is smaller than itself, um, is actually contradictory, right? So um, if, uh, again, let, let's play it through. Let's say uh, a C, we assume that a C exists, which is smaller than itself. Okay, then um, 
use the um, for t we are going to use um, x equals to c right so the, the property that we are going to look at is that um, x equals c then uh, the assumption of um, the, um, the least number principle holds right because there there exists an, a, a number which is equal to c um, and also um, we we know that this thing like by this argument, this thing is uh, is true, right? The negation of this existential statement holds, right? With R being the smaller than relation. Um, but since uh, that is negated, but we have proven it to be true, we imply absurdum. Okay, so this is uh, like I, I try to compactify it a little bit to be be, be smaller, but. Um, uh, if you are more interested in it, then just play it through yourself, right? Um, make the assumption, like write down a list of assumptions. Like we exist, we are, we assume that the, this uh, least number principle holds. We assume that there is a C which has a property that is smaller than itself. And what does it mean if you um, uh, look at this implication? And you, if you take everything apart, uh, and you you um, take into account that the number c is smaller than itself so that both t holds and, and not t holds where, where t is this equality relation then there's just too many things that are true and you get a contradiction okay i hope that makes sense so this this shows how induction um in the form of the least number principle actually rules out that the number is smaller than itself right so in 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 piano arithmetic no number is smaller than itself and the the c element um is not a legal model and um i like if you look at the set theoretical an analogy where um you, you impose the, uh, the set induction which you know it's like transfinite induction or if you directly impose regularity which corresponds to the least number principle then it rules out these uh, objects which contain themselves exactly with the same proof like you can play everything through there you have this general relation in this case it's not smaller than natural numbers but this membership and then by adopting these axioms you rule out this possibility as a model and indeed you know i mean you can go on the wikipedia page and prove that this singleton which contains itself is ruled out by the axiom of regularity like in a two-liner right i have i i like um cooked up a much more broader um, context for this sort of um, proofs of non-existence of um, self-relation. But this is how, how things happen, right? How, how um, models of a theory are ruled out by adopting this induction axiom, by certain structures are ruled out. Okay. Um, and, okay, I've already noted that. And, and so finally, in the last minutes, I want to uh, emphasize that also, if you in, in adopt induction, uh, it's still the case that the theory will have non-standard models. And what happens is, I have this here. So this is from a blog of, I think, a student of um, set theorist Hemkins. Um, and there's this picture. This is what... Uh, one of the countable non-standard models of piano arithmetic still look like. So um, you have the theory of piano arithmetic. It has the induction axiom. It's like this first order theory. But um, it's still uh, possible to find a model, and you can encode it, for example, in set theory, which has more elements than just the natural numbers. For example, then you might have encoded them as for normal numbers, these normal behaving numbers, right? So what happens here is this, you say, I, um, I assume the existence of an um, element C, which is bigger than all the standard natural numbers, right? The first order theory can actually not talk, um, um, like it cannot really distinguish with quantifiers um, between the standard natural numbers and the numbers which come after after the initial segment but what you can do in the theory like we do did already with the induction schema is you add an, an uh, infinite amount 
comfortably infinite amount of similarly looking recursive axioms and these axioms are of the shape that you say for every uh, number zero the success of zero the success of success of zero and so on you add the, as axioms that all the statements the individual statements that these are all smaller than c and what you get then is that there's the natural numbers um, with all numbers that you are familiar with so to speak and then there's a c and but we you know we, we, we proved by induction that no number is smaller than itself so this c does not have the property that is smaller than itself however um it is legal that it is there and the the induction axiom and the other rules the other axioms of our theory now imply that there are even more elements so for example for um uh, for taking c we can form the successor and the success of that and the success of that and these numbers must all be different so starting from c there is uh, a structure which looks exactly again like the natural numbers but it does not start at zero but it starts at c right zero is a special number in the natural numbers by the axioms right everything times zero is, is again zero and so on and so forth so zero is still here but c is here and there starts an, another um, se sequence of numbers which again are so, sort of like like the natural numbers in the sense that they start somewhere and go where but we've also proven or we have not actually proven in this video but it's also provable from induction that every number has a predecessor or a, or a zero right okay the zero is here it doesn't have a predecessor but here c is different from zero so that must mean by the statement that every non-zero number has a predecessor that there's a predecessor and that's why the numbers go backwards from here right it says oh, you know, there must be one number which is free before z, uh, c. And so this number free before c exists as well. And this is, is still not contradictory. You just say there is more numbers. And um, then what also happens is um, you can uh, do division without rest um, in, in the naturals, right? So an even number you can divide by two and an uneven number divide by two, uh, like minus one divided by two. And so what s sadly, so to speak, happens is you get a bunch of uh, like fractions times C and these behave again like, like these two-sided natural numbers, right? So this whole thing is basically the natural numbers plus and then for every rational number, like for example, three over two, another block which looks like the integers because it goes back and forward from this number, right? And it's funny, but this sort of construction um, still fulfills all the the axioms of arithmetic, right? You might believe that it fulfills the, the, the simple axioms that are also part of Robinson arithmetic, but it also, and this is like, difficult more difficult to discuss um because it, it goes in the questions of consistency it also fulfills the induction axiom it says basically the induction axiom now says that if something is true for zero and it's if it's true for any number it's also true for the successor number right for for this or this for this or this then the property actually holds for all numbers so it's fascinating to think about how uh, piano arithmetic it does not really know what it's talking about, right? Of course, we have the standard model in mind, but there are other models. And if you write down for all numbers, then piano arithmetic does not know. There's no, no sense in which there's just the initial segment of natural numbers that you're used to. If you have the first order theory of arithmetic, then you could also as well be talking about this sort of numbers with <laughs> this infinite jump, so to speak. Um, if a, a theory has just one model, we, we call it categorical and more is to be said about that. For example, the situation is a little bit nicer in second order arithmetic where there's categorical models of the piano axioms is also where the initial axioms of piano. Um, however, second order arithmetic itself has different metallurgical properties than first order logic. Like f the first order, like second order theory, second order um, quantifiers have different properties. Okay. So um, with that all said, uh, this is where I want to quit. Um, I hope it was informative. I will probably make a video, another video on, on induction uh, because a lot more is to be said, um, especially about set theory, right? I have talked about regularity and the relation to, to least number principle, but I, in this video, I mostly talked about arithmetic, but 
the story goes on with induction on the Z-Fury side. Take care.